I'll be reading from the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 12 through 20. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, May no one ever eat fruit from you again, and his disciples heard him say it. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus and his disciples went out to the city, went out of the city. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. This is God's word. You may recall that uh, I mentioned last week that when you reach chapter 11 of Mark, as you're reading through it, you reach a turning point. Because when chapter 11 begins, Mark is beginning his focus on Christ's Passion Week, the week of Christ's sufferings, okay? And that that week consists of just seven days. So from here on out in Mark, Mark is focusing on the events that transpired over just a seven-day period, whereas the previous part of it is he's covered almost a three-year span. Okay, so think about how important this section of the book of Mark is, because he dedicates a huge percentage of his efforts to recording it as the Holy Spirit guides him. And also remember, whose memoirs is Mark recording? The Apostle Peter. Peter was sharing his story of his life with Jesus through what you might call his secretary, Mark. So keep those things in mind. Now, as we met last week, we saw those last seven days sort of kicked off as Jesus entered the city of Jerusalem for what would be the final time. He entered riding on the colt of a donkey. And of course, the the, the seven-day period that was kicked off with that entrance into Jerusalem will be culminated with his resurrection from the dead after after having been crucified. So this is the period that we are dealing with. Now we are told in Mark chapter 11 that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on that Palm Sunday as evening was approaching. And we are also told that Jesus made his way once he entered the city to the temple precincts, which was sort of the central portion of Jerusalem. He went in and he scoped it out. He had a look around. And since it was already near evening, the scriptures tell us, he left the city and went back out to Bethany, where presumably he spent the night, probably at the home of his dear friends, Mary and Martha and Lazarus, whom he had only recently risen back to life after Lazarus had died. So a lot of the huge throng praising Jesus as he entered Jerusalem was stemming from the fact that Jesus had just done this incredible miracle of raising Lazarus back to life. So apparently Jesus has gone back out to Bethany to spend the night, and you ask yourself, so why would he have done that? Well, remember that there is a divine time schedule here. We've been calling this divinely choreographed, and I can imagine what might have happened if Jesus had spent that night in the city as opposed to out in the precincts, out uh, out in the villages surrounding. Anyway, things might have been uh, sped up a little bit too quickly. So he's sort of controlling the timing of events, I think, by doing this. Now, we also learn from our passage today that when Jesus got up the next morning after overnighting in the surrounding village of Bethany, that he and his disciples early in the morning made their way back into the city precincts. And we are told that as he's on the way into the city, something odd happens and it stood out to Mark because he recorded it. It obviously stood out to Peter because Peter was there and he shared the remembrance of this with Mark who wrote it down. Okay, It was a very strange event that has confused Bible readers for 2,000 years. When we read it, we don't quite understand why Jesus would behave the way that he did. 
frankly, because it seems rather out of character for Jesus. What was it? Well, verses 12 through 14 tell us. The next day as they were leaving Bethany and going where? Into the city of Jerusalem. Jesus was what? Hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it wasn't the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, and how do we know this? Because we have eyewitness testimony recorded for us. He said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Now, there is a recent ad campaign that kind of cracks me up. It's, uh, it's an ad for Snickers. And it says, uh, you're not you when you're hungry. You know, you've seen it, and, and I picture the, the one that sort of stands out in my mind. It's, got, it's featuring a rap artist. I think, is, I think he goes by the name of Boogie. You know, I, don't, I don't follow rap, but I think that's his name. At least that's what, I, that's what I found on the Internet anyway. So this rap artist named Boogie, and, and he's apparently not, because he's hungry, he's not performing up to par, and all that will come out of him is Elton John. You've seen that, okay? It's like, it's like Elton John trying to do Boogie's thing. And, and it, so, so what they do is the, the rest of everybody gives him a Snickers bar and finally his inner self can come out. And it's, and it's the rap artist again, okay? Well, I, you read this passage and you think, is this kind of Jesus being grouchy? Is this Jesus needing a Snickers bar? He's hungry. He goes up to a fig tree. There's no fruit on it. And he curses it. It's like, Jesus... I've never seen you grouchy like this. And it reminds me of, of kind of the way I am when I don't have things going my way. And I was picturing myself laying on my cold, dirty garage floor underneath my lawn tractor with a wrench in my hand trying to get my bleeding arm up to get the wrench on a bolt head that's way up in there between supports and, and rods and blades and belts and just can hardly get it up there. And I finally get it up there, again, all bleeding from scraping my knuckles against stuff. I find that, you know what? This wrench doesn't fit a metric bolt head. And, you, and I don't even own the right wrench. And you know how bad I want to throw the wrench that is in my hands? It's like, okay, when things don't go my way, I just want to curse something. Are you not similar? And we wonder... Is this what's going on with Jesus as he, as he goes to this fig tree and there's no fruit on it, and so he curses it? And no wonder we feel like this is out of character for Jesus. What is going on with Jesus here? We project that kind of attitude on him because it's all we know. He's walking along, Mark says. He's hungry. He sees a fig tree in the distance, and so he goes to look to see if there's any fruit on it. There isn't, and so he says to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And Mark says, the disciples all heard him say it. Have you wondered what the disciples are thinking to themselves? So friends, is this what we might call a temper tantrum? Is this a peevish fit? appropriate only for an immature, bratty adolescent coming out of Jesus? You know, what makes this even more confusing and troubling is the fact that Mark tells us point blank it's not even the season for figs to be growing on the fig trees. Did you catch that? So what gives, Jesus? Did you not know that? And how dare you curse a tree for not bearing figs when it's not even the season for fig bearing? That would be like me driving out to Fort Royal, Virginia to pick apples in the middle of February and then getting mad at the trees because they don't have apples on them. So who should be ashamed there, the trees? No, me. It's not the right season for apples. How dare I get mad at the trees and curse the trees for not producing apples in February? Who's the idiot? Me. So that makes us even more confused because Mark says it wasn't even the season for bearing figs. Is Jesus in need of a Snickers? Now, 
funny, at this point, Mark cuts away from the scene at said cursed fig tree, and he switches, rather unceremoniously, to another scene without resolving the issue with the fig tree. All he did is say, Jesus cursed the fig tree, and the disciples heard him do it. And the next thing you know, he's going into Jerusalem and something else happens. Here's what it says, verses 15 through 17. And we assume at first glance that what happens here had nothing to do with the fig tree, which I think is a mistake, which we'll see a little bit later. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. Picture this. He overturned tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. Boy, he is having a rough morning. He's really in a foul mood. This is the way it all appears, because this is right after cursing a fig tree. And he wouldn't allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temples, the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? But you've made it a den of robbers. Now, as we've made clear already over the last couple of weeks, what season of the year is it? The week Jesus enters Jerusalem? It's Passover season. And we've already made it clear that thousands of Jewish pilgrims are pouring into Jerusalem at this time so they might give full expression to their Passover enthusiasm. Did you know that it was actually required, expected, I guess I should say, of Jewish males 12 years old and older to return to Jerusalem for Passover no matter where they were living? And for some folks, this would require days of travel. For some folks, it would require even weeks of travel. So you've got pilgrims like that who are pouring into Jerusalem at this time. Now think about something. How would travel have been done at that day? Were they going to get on a bus? No, they were going to walk it. Or they were going to ride some animal in a caravan. Now think. Traveling can be a challenge even in today's age. I know the more traveling I have done, the more of an advocate I have become of traveling light. And I want to try to get everything I can in a carry-on, if possible. I don't like the separation of me and my luggage, because you never know if your luggage is going to end up where you are. You know, And it makes things easier if you can just throw it all in the overhead bin and then get off the plane and you got it all, and you don't have to go to that carousel and wonder if your stuff's even going to come out of the carousel. You know, so traveling light is good. But you know, when you're traveling with animals, that makes it a little bit more difficult to travel light, doesn't it? I remember being on buses in the West African Republic of, Republic of Mali and being on buses in the Republic of Chad in Central Africa. And man, that is an experience because not only are the buses sort of held together with uh, pieces of cut off, blown out inner tube and glue and tape, but the population on the bus is not entirely human. There are chickens, and there are goats, and there are sheep mixed in with the people, and the goats and the chickens and the sheep are sometimes tied up so that they can't run off, and they're buying, and they're, and they're braying, and they're squawking, and feathers are flying around, and they're and then you got, you got goats tied up, stuffed under the seats and in the overhead bins. It's really kind of wild. It's just an experience that you're not going to have here in the United States. It's the third world, my friend. Okay, it's crazy. All this to highlight that when you travel with animals, it's kind of complicated. You, it's hard to kind of travel light. I heard an interview on the radio this last week about a woman who completed the Iditarod. And she was talking about the fact that she almost had to bail because she was, she was delayed and was running out of food for the dogs who drew the sled. And I'm thinking, man, how much weight did you have to carry just to keep the dogs fed? Which is kind of the point. Now, here's the deal. When you were a pilgrim returning to Jerusalem for Passover, you were obligated to have Passover animals, sacrificial animals. So you had to bring them with you. Unless, of course... You could just buy them when you arrived in Jerusalem. What a great idea. And so that's what you see going on when you reach verse 15. Here's what it says. Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. Ask the question, what were they buying and selling? Sacrificial animals. Sacrificial animals. Why would they have done that? 
because it was much more convenient for pilgrims to just buy the animals than it was to drag them from home. Just think convenience. Now it says, he overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and wouldn't allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. Now, there is another layer to this to be explored. Actually, there are several layers. One layer is this. As we said, you could opt to bring your required animal sacrifices from your stock at home, but there was no guarantee. First of all, well, it was inconvenient. And then there was no guarantee that your sacrifice would pass muster. It had to be inspected. And guess who the inspectors were? The pr same priests that are selling the sacrificial animals. Do you not see the conflict of interest here? It's much easier for them to reject your animal if they know they've got one to sell you and from which they can profit. This is what's happening in Jerusalem. Theologian William Hendrickson says it this way. He says that the odds of your home-raised animal being found acceptable by the temple officials were small, especially since the priestly machinery made a large profit by selling sacrificial animals there in the temple at Jerusalem. Now you've got to follow what's going on here. The picture is now emerging. The religious leaders have what we call a racket going on in the temple. They were at once both the animal inspectors and the sellers of approved animals. Hmm. Now they stood to profit by rejecting your animal, and it smells a little fishy, a little fishy. Now, rely on your own experience. Where do you expect to find a cheaper hot dog? At Safeway or at FedEx Field? Okay. Now you understand what was going on in the temple. Why would the hot dogs be more expensive at FedEx Field? You're kind of held over a barrel there. You want a hot dog, you're going to have to pay. And you can't, you're not allowed to bring it in. So use your own experience to understand this. So here you've got people who are wanting to worship God, these pilgrims flooding into town, and they're being placed in a vulnerable position by the religious and cultural machinery, and these folks are being exploited. That might help you understand Jesus' reaction. Now, our passage also mentions money changers, which also adds another layer to this money changers. Think, there was also a temple tax that had to be paid by adult Jewish males. And if you were from out of town, you had foreign currency, but the temple tax would only be received in Jewish currency because that Gentile stuff is filthy. It's corrupted. Not to worry. They'll change your money for you at a reasonable rate, and so they extort and they inflate the price of currency exchange going on in the temple courts. Such was the religious machinery at work in Jerusalem's temple, that Passover. Now, be reminded, who is it that's running the racket? It's the priests, the very people who are supposed to be in charge of taking spiritual care of Israel. The very people who are supposed to be helping people connect with God and see God. But they're busy extorting and profiting from vulnerable worshipers. Now, one more layer to peel back before we move ahead. It's this thing called the court of the Gentiles. From the very beginning, when God hand-grooved and molded his people group, he had a vision for them. When he made the nation of Israel, he desired them to be a people who would be a kingdom of priests, a priest nation, if you will, that would represent the true God before the rest of the world. God had a missionary heart, and he wanted a people group that would speak for him and represent him, where people could look at them and see that they are a reflection of the true God. They even set up the temple so that they had a court where it would be a House of prayer for all peoples. There was this part of the temple that was reserved for Gentiles, non-Jewish people, where Gentiles, all the peoples of the world, could come in and find it to be a house of prayer for all peoples. Well, guess where all this trafficking was occurring? In the only part in the whole temple complex where the Gentiles were allowed to be. So imagine you are a worshiper. 
and you want to go for a quiet time of prayer, would you choose the floor of the New York Stock Exchange? Probably not. Imagine going for a quiet time in the middle of a livestock auction house where you've got animals braying and bleeding and, and you've, got, you've got market hungry breeders and sellers getting frustrated and angry with, with each other because they want a certain price and you don't want to pay a certain price. Imagine trying to have a time of quiet prayer in such a setting. Well, welcome to the court of the Gentiles at Passover season. So this magnificent temple, which has been designed by God to be a house of prayer and worship for all people, has become what Jesus called it, a den of robbers. Now look at it this way. In short, Israel's shepherds now are making it harder for people to see and connect appropriately with God. They're not making it easy. They're making it harder. Now you understand Jesus' reaction in the temple when he sees all of this set up and going on. And it gives you a clue as to how God feels about certain kinds of things. Let me suggest these to you. One, how does God feel? Well, look at Jesus. How does God feel when people stand in the way of other people getting to know God? Look at Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus told his disciples that it would be better for them to have a millstone hung around their necks and thrown into the sea than to cause one of these little ones to stumble? Well, you're looking at it right here. This is what it looked like. It gives you insight as to how God feels when people misrepresent, misrepresent God. When people give the impression that God is like this, when he's really like that. And it gives you an understanding of how God feels when people take spiritual good news and they burden it down with extraneous baggage. And they distort it and confuse it. We see it in Jesus' actions. So, Let's say this, it's especially grievous to God when the people who are doing this are the very people who've been given a position of spiritual oversight. And that was so much a warning to me as I thought about this this week. Boy, I never want to be guilty of this. Lord, help me. So God has this longing to bear fruit in the lives of his people, Israel, and he longs for his people to bear fruit that blesses all of the other peoples of the world. And what have they turned his fig orchard into? Exactly what you've seen. And so Jesus, we are told in other Gospels, makes a homemade whip. And it literally drives out the merchants, the sellers, the money changers. He's kicking over tables. Birds are running all over the place. Cattle are being chased out. Sheep, goats. Imagine the picture. And imagine what we were suggesting about Jesus. Is this Jesus just having a really bad mood morning? Or can we now understand what's happening here? Now it doesn't stop. Sometimes I wonder, when I think about this scene, I wonder what it would have looked like. Can you envision it? Can you envision angry Jesus? Can you envision one person going into a very crowded temple complex, perhaps with hundreds of merchants, and single-handedly driving them out. And I wonder, how is that even possible? There were temple police. And I wonder, how is it possible for one man, Jesus, to break all that up? I would imagine that any single individual who went in there and tried to make this happen would have been apprehended, bound, and thrown into prison. Why would they let him do what he did? For me, honestly, that is a huge question. And to me, it speaks of this strange, amazing authority of Jesus that these merchants just let him 
humiliate them. He let them, he let Jesus, they let Jesus run them out of the temple complex. I don't know. Now, we have to turn back to where we began with this poor little accursed fig tree, because this all goes hand in glove. Mark cuts back to it now. Verses 19 and 21. Here's how he does it. He says, when evening came, this is the evening after Jesus has just done this in the temple, Jesus' disciples went out of the city. In the morning, so this now would have been Tuesday morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree. How did they see it? What did it look like? Read it. Withered from the roots. Okay, stop and think about that. Have you ever seen a tree just die overnight like that? Peter remembered, and he said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered. Do you sense astonishment? Do you sense surprise? I think you're supposed to. The disciples are stunned. They don't expect this. And I think, obviously, at first glance, we are meant once again to see the incredible miraculous power and the authority of Jesus, similar to Jesus choosing to ride into town on a donkey that had never been broken, which we saw last week, similar to the fact that Jesus speaks to a storm system and it disbands immediately, Similarly, similar to the fact that Jesus creates wine, bypassing all of the natural processes of time and fermentation, he turns water into wine. It's the best wine they've ever had. What are we to learn here? Well, at first glance, I think you are meant to see the miraculous power and authority of Jesus. But there's more to see here, friends. This is an extraordinary event, and i got to tell you. This is a miracle of Jesus. Does this miracle seem different to you? I would like to hear your input. If you think this miracle seems different, I would like to hear your take as to why it seems different. What's different about this miracle? Any clues? Yeah, Mike? You're either brilliant or you read your notes. This is the last miracle of Jesus that Mark has chosen to record. And it is the only one of the miracles that is destructive. You can construe it as destructive. In other words, Jesus is withering something instead of making it whole. Whoa. That's kind of weird. Why now? What about this particular point in time causes Jesus to show his power in what we might construe as a negative way? I get the sense that this particular work of Jesus is one in which Israel is being sentenced for its stubbornness and for her rejection of all of the wonders that have preceded this one. Now, it's interesting how Mark seems to link these two acts of Jesus together, the outrage in the temple and the cursing of the fig tree. He links them as though these two scenes belong together, like a hand in a glove. And indeed, I think they do. Look on the screen. I believe that this fig tree cursing incident is actually what you might call a parable that is being dramatized or enacted. This isn't about Jesus being grouchy. This is about Jesus giving a parable without telling it in a story form. You know, he would tell parables like the sower and the seed and the soils and all of that in a story form, but there were also parables that he deliberately acted out without using the words. So this one is a parable that is being acted out, the kind that the Old Testament prophets would often do. And it is related to what temple worship had degenerated into, as we have seen. The withering of the fruitless fig tree and the cleansing of the temple are together being used by Jesus as a picture of God's judgment on Israel. Now think about this. This occurred to me this week. Jesus has already, just a couple weeks earlier, a couple chapters earlier in the text, he's made an astonishing announcement. Do you remember when he said to the disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him. And then he said, who do you say that I am? And Peter speaks up for the group and says, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Did you know 
that Jesus is reported in the Gospels as having said to Peter at that time and to the group, he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And on this rock, I will build the nation of Israel? No. On this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Has Jesus not already indicated a change in plan? A setting aside of one favored spokesman for a new one? The church, which he was instituting even as he spoke those words to Peter? So the withering of the fig tree, which was painting a picture of a judged and rejected Israel, also is indicating the transfer of a blessing of usefulness onto this new thing, this new organism which Jesus is about to create. The church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. Now again, I want to go back to William Hendrickson as we begin to wind this up. Listen to it. He calls this fig tree the pretentious fig tree, which meaning which means it had all the signs of bearing fruit, but it bore none. It wasn't the season. He says, the pretentious fig tree had its counterpart in the temple, where on this very day, a lively business was being transacted, transacted so that sacrifices might be made. Well, at the same time, the priests are plotting to put to death the very one apart from whom these offerings had no meaning whatever. Plenty of leaves, but no fruit. Bustling religious activity, but no sincerity and no truth. Tremendous promise, but a very poor performance. And in cursing the fig tree and in cleansing the temple... Jesus performs two symbolic prophetic acts with one meaning. He's predicting the downfall of unfruitful Israel and in the place of Israel, an international and everlasting kingdom would be established, a nation bringing forth not just leaves, but fruit and gathered from both Jews in Gentiles, my friends, that's the church. Now, for personal reflection, how might this apply to you as an individual? How might it apply to me as an individual? Well, just ask yourself, is the gospel of Jesus bearing fruit in your life? A lot of leaves, but no fruit. A lot of noise, but no truth. How about the life of the church? Is the gospel of Jesus bearing fruit? There's a lot of energy and activity, but no fruit. Think of the picture of the temple. All kinds of machinery going on, but no fruit. I'm going to leave you with three takeaways from these hand-in-glove events. Three takeaways. And hopefully these will go better in here than they are across the hall. Here you go. I would like us to see here what I'll call the displeasure of God over the misuse of spiritual privilege and position, because that's huge. That is here. And ask yourself, where in your life might this be? Is there a misuse of spiritual privilege in your own life? Because this is what was going on with the Jewish leaders and the temple. I want you also to note here the reaction of God towards the victimization of people who are vulnerable. Who were the vulnerable people in the temple? All those pilgrims traveling who were kind of at the mercy of the priests and had to pay these prices who were being extorted. And who were the victimizers? The religious leaders, the priests, the people entrusted with oversight and leadership. Where could this exist in your life? And thirdly, last takeaway, I want us to learn the tragedy of taking things and opportunities that are by nature holy and profaning them, turning, into, turning them into something foul and corrupted. 
Think of this. Jesus referred to the temple as a place of prayer for all people, and it got turned into a center for exploitation and profiteering. Something wonderful and beautiful had been turned into something ugly and base. And are you a party to something like that in your life? Be aware. Let's pray. Father, these are challenging thoughts. I would not say that this is an easy passage of Scripture. And I think the message is rather deep. And it's not a message that we are all eager to hear all the time. Lord, I pray that we would learn about your heart from what we have seen here. And we pray that we would explore areas of our lives where our lives are not lining up with what you care about. And I pray that it would cause us to take action and that you would give us the strength to make changes that are necessary. I do thank you for the blessing of your choice to make us fruit-bearing. Lord, what a great privilege to be a part of your church upon which you placed your blessing and your sanction as an organization, an organism through which you would bear fruit in this world. And I pray that we would not misuse the privilege but we would take it on as a mantle, an honored mantle, and that we would engage with our best in working together with you in representing you in the world and bearing fruit. Lord, the fruit-bearing ability does not lie within us. It lies within you, and yet you've called us to partner. Thank you for the opportunity to explore these incredible verses and to see how they might apply to our lives and to the life of your church this morning. This I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.